Wow. Uh, I got to say, first and foremost, that I'm really glad to be back here. Uh, I've always enjoyed speaking in Krakow, and, and uh, I missed you guys. Um, I missed Krakow. I missed this show. I missed this stage. I mean, this is like the most... I, I almost feel like I want to put on a production of Les Miserables. Valjean, Valjean... Okay, never mind. I won't do that. Um, quick and dirty. Quick show of hands. How many people, if uh, you're, somebody comes to you and says that we did a project and we did it quick and dirty, how many of you go, oh, shit? Show of hands. Yeah. I mean, for the most part in the industry, we agree it's bad. Ten years from now, Edgar Dijkstra, pretty, pretty you know, smart guy. Ten years from now, when you're doing something quick and dirty, you suddenly visualize that I am looking over your shoulders. I mean, he's dead, so if he's looking over my shoulders, we have a real problem. Dijkstra would not have liked this. Well, that would be enough immortality for me. Fair enough. Martin Fowler, another really smart guy. Doing things quick and dirty way sets us up with technical debt. How many people have heard that phrase before? It's become pretty common, right? And debt is bad, right? Similar to financial debt, tech debt incurs interest payments, which come in the form of extra effort we have to do because of the quick and dirty design choice, blah, blah, blah. Get in underwater, interest payments, etc. Bad. Throw away code. You may not be familiar with these two guys. They came out of the patterns movement. Foot and Yoder did a number of early pattern languages. And one of the things that they coined was really what we would consider sort of the anti-patterns movement. They talked about, for example, throwaway code. Quick and dirty code that was intended to be used only once and then discarded. However, such code often takes on a life of its own. It works. Why fix it? The quickest way to address it is to just modify it rather than design a proper general program. Over time, a simple throwaway program begets a big ball of mud. How many of you have ever been on one of those projects? Right? A couple of hands. Yeah. You start working, you know, the boss comes to you and says, we just need to come up with a quick and dirty little website to show marketing. And so you do that. You go home, you like maybe download React. You download one of the React CSS frameworks to go with it. Looks pretty nice, right? And you got just like some SQLite database hanging out back there, storing data. And then you show it to the marketing guys and the marketing guys are like, Ooh, we like this. And in the back of your mind, all of a sudden, you start feeling like you're in a slow motion action film. Because the marketing guys say, we should, and you're like, ship it. And you're like, crap. And then, because you're the one that built it, and hey, went into production, right? Every engineer loves that. Your boss keeps you on that project. And you're like, I really don't want to, no, 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 this, this project is mission critical. We need you on this project. But I mean, really, we could pull anybody, no, it's you. So then you're like, okay, fine, I'm gonna quit this company and I'm, I don't know, I'm gonna fly to Poland and speak at a conference. And while you're there, somebody comes up to you and says, didn't you work on that project for that company? I saw your name in the GitHub commits. It just, it's, it's like, as developers, we're kind of like Jedi. We're tuned into the force, and whenever somebody does a quick and dirty project and it goes into production, it's like the destruction of Alderaan all over again. Billions of voices crying out in a single unified voice. Ship it. It's bad. The end, thank you for coming to my keynote. Except, you start digging in, you start exploring this term, we don't always seem to agree that it's bad. If you actually take the phrase quick and dirty, plug it into Google, you get a couple of responses, right? The quick and dirty guide to is often used as kind of an introductory, a tutorial, something that's designed to get you going fairly quickly. You see this with several different language tutorials, for example. The quick and dirty guide to Java, the quick and dirty guide to Scala, the quick and dirty guide to Ballerina, 
And you're like, ooh, okay, I like that, because as a developer, I don't need to know all of the ins and outs of the type system theory that underlies this language. Just show me the syntax and tell me how to compile, and I'll play with it from there. If we talk about quick, you know, we talk about particular topics, particular subjects, it's actually pretty popular in the, in the management space. If you want a quick and dirty guide to accounting, quick and dirty guide to budgeting, quick and dirty guide to, you know, how to interview and hire candidates, those tend to go pretty well. They tend to sell pretty well. By the way, there is an entry in the Urban Dictionary for quick and dirty, which I will not tell you what it means because it would probably get me banned from the country. Quick and dirty clearly has some different implications depending upon who you talk to. And in fact, I argue, and that's the point of this keynote, that there is a time and a place where quick and dirty is exactly the right thing to do. Most of the time, when you start exploring this, if you know, we sit down, over like a beer or something, and we start talking about, okay, quick and dirty, what do you not like about this phrase? Most people are actually pretty comfortable with the concept of quick. I mean, you know, quick, fast, without a whole lot of delay. Most people are actually pretty comfortable with the idea that we could turn something out quickly. And as a matter of fact, you talk to pretty much any software developer, generally faster is better. We're constantly looking for ways to try to make our code you know, quicker, trying to make our code uh, quicker to develop, quicker to production, quicker to diagnose and debug, quicker and easier to monitor. We don't have a lot of problems with quick. It's the dirty part that tends to set people's teeth on edge. The dirty part suggests that we perhaps didn't use the right choice of technology. The dirty part, perhaps we didn't think about how this system might scale once we got more people using it. The dirty part says we, we just took whatever shortcuts we could to get to the point where it was done, such as, for example, we just decided we we're gonna run it on one machine, period. We're not gonna worry about any sort of distribution. We're not gonna put any sort of caching in place. We're not gonna put any sort of replication. We're just going to do whatever it takes to get this thing across the finish line, even if, even if we have to do a little bit of you know, smoke and mirrors because you know, the emphasis here is on quick. Martin Fowler's technical debt analogy comes to mind, right? The idea that we, basically went out and did the technical equivalent of charging this whole thing on a credit card, right? We didn't actually do the work, earn the money, then buy the thing. We just said, hey, slap down a credit card. That's all we need. We're good to go. We'll worry about the debt later. Tra-la-la, 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 right? We can choose to continue paying the interest or we can pay down the principal by refactoring the quick and dirty design into the better design. But the interesting thing is when you start diving into the concept, if we take this, this idea of technical debt and relate it more closely to financial debt, once you start diving into the world of financial debt, you discover very quickly that there are such things as good debt, and bad debt. I don't know how it exactly works here in Poland. I'd be willing to bet it's pretty similar. In the United States, you have a credit score that's kind of a reflection of you know, how good you are as a consumer. Are you somebody that we can in fact loan a fair amount of money to? And I couldn't tell you how it's calculated because quite frankly, it sort of strikes me as a little bit of magic anyway. But generally speaking, if your score is about 800 or so, you have very, very good credit. And if your score is like 200 or so, not even your brother will loan you any money, right? So when you start diving in, I, for, for the last couple of years, I actually was working at a mortgage company, Rocket Mortgage. And in talking with some of the bankers there, one of the things that we discovered is, yeah, actually having no debt whatsoever does not get you the best credit score. Because part of the idea is, if a bank wants to loan you money, 
they want to make sure that you are comfortable and familiar with the idea of paying off debts. As a matter of fact, having a mortgage, you went out, you bought a house, and now you're making steady payments on that mortgage, that is generally considered good debt. Mortgage debt, car loans, um, occasionally, depending upon how they're structured, like if you did sort of a refinance in order to be able to acquire a second property, blah, blah, blah. The point is there's a certain amount of debt that people actually in the financial world will say, no, that's good debt. That indicates a healthy relationship with your debt. There's some structure around that, but the idea that any sort of debt can be a good thing often comes as a surprise to us when we're not in the financial space. Most of us, when we incur a debt, we're like, oh gosh, gotta pay it off, right? Because otherwise, you know, the interest payments can start to rack up and there was a time actually in the United States where it was really popular to have an interest only loan where essentially you could take out a mortgage and your payments were only to pay off the interest for that month. You never actually touched the principal. Those didn't last very long. That was not considered a great way to buy a house. But Fowler actually touches on this. This is one of the things I think that gets left out of the conversation when we start talking about technical debt. People have made a considered choice to adopt a design strategy that isn't sustainable in the longer term, but yields a short-term benefit. In other words, it's kind of like you walked into the Apple store with your 10-year-old MacBook, which still works, by the way, but it doesn't have, you know, it's only got like four gigs of memory on it, and it's only got like maybe a couple hundred gigs of drive space, and you're constantly fighting with it, and you install these larger and larger IDEs, and you want to start doing things in various modern environments. Maybe you want to start developing games or whatnot. And you see the new MacBook. Oh. It's always under a shaft of light. Have you ever noticed that? If you walk into the Apple store, the new MacBook Pros are always under this spotlight, right? You're like, you, you feel like Indiana Jones staring at the golden idol. Ah, oh, I want one. And it's not just that you want any one. No, 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 no. We're developers, right? We're not just going to get any MacBook Pro. It's going to be the largest screen available, the 16-inch. It's going to have the most amount of memory, 64 gigs. Not that I've done this, by the way. Eight gigs of drive space? Chills, man. And it's like 6,000 US, which is 25,000 is a lot me or something like that. And you're like, wow. And here I just forgot to pack my wad of cash that I can just slap down on the counter and buy one of these. Let's be honest, most of us don't have several thousand dollars just laying around with nothing to do. So you say, ooh, I could use it. There's a lot of things I could do with it. You turn to your spouse, it's an investment, honey. <laughs> That's about the reaction I get from my spouse too. She just starts laughing, sometimes hysterically. Is that good? Am I that funny? Anyway, and you put it on a credit card. Credit card debt is bad. It's terrible. That is actually bad debt. That is the kind of debt that will get you into trouble. Credit card debt is bad. Why would you do this? Because you're making a deliberate decision. You could wait for the however many months it would take you to save up the money in order to buy that MacBook, or you put it on the credit card and you pay a little extra every month in order to be able to have that thing now. As a matter of fact, if you're really, really good about this, you can actually buy the MacBook, get some freelance work, and make more money than you were making before. Honestly, honey, that's what I'll do. That never seemed to work that way, but we make these deliberate decisions to engage in short-term benefit knowing that if we don't address it, it could become a long-term problem, but it helps us get past an obstacle right now. 
That is the power of incurring that kind of debt. The debt yields value sooner, but needs to be paid off as quickly as possible. The debt metaphor reminds us about the choices we can make with design flaws. So the useful distinction isn't between debt or non-debt, but between prudent and reckless debt. Not all debt is bad. Now, Fowler also goes on to say, there's also a difference between deliberate and inadvertent debt. Deliberate debt, I walked into the MacBook store with the credit card ready to take this on. The inadvertent debt is my car blows up. I was not planning to incur this additional expense, but I have to get it fixed. So again, I reach for the credit card in order to get me past an obstacle that could otherwise be very, very difficult. And I realize most of the people in here are like, car? Oh right, he's in the United States where we don't have public transit. Closest thing we've got to public transit is if you stand on the street corner and wave, eventually somebody will kidnap you. (laughs) This leads to an interesting sort of two-dimensional grid. Deliberate and reckless. That's what we most normally associate with the whole concept of quick and dirty. Right? The classic scenario where the boss comes to you and says, ah, just, just don't design anything, just slap something together and get it up on the production side. Just get, it, get it going. Marketing guys need to see a prototype. That's usually the word that we throw at this, right? Marketing wants a prototype of what it could look like. And yeah, prototype means we don't have to bother with any of that messy architecture stuff. We don't have to bother with any of that messy design stuff. We don't need any specifications. You don't even need to talk to the marketing guys. I already, I already talked to them. I know what they want. Just slap something together and get it out as quickly as possible. Deliberate and reckless. That's not a great combination. Then there's the inadvertent reckless. This is where you actually incur technical debt out of a degree of ignorance. I actually teach at University of Seattle for the college known as the Information School. It's kind of like a CS program, computer science program, except if you take out the heavy emphasis on algorithms and add an emphasis around like business and entrepreneurship and so forth. And one of the things that I frequently find as I teach the students is that, damn, they're stupid. I mean, don't get me wrong, at the age of 21, I was pretty stupid too. But at my current age, I have forgotten how much I didn't know back then. And so in many cases, as I start working with them, as they start working, I have them do group projects two or three weeks at the end of the quarter, form them into a group of about four or five people, tell them to go off and do something non-trivial. Just go build something that's interesting, mobile apps, because I teach iOS and Android. And when they start working on their application, they often don't make use of some of the very patterns that we as professionals have kind of grown used to. You know, notion of a repository, the notion of having single responsibility principle, all that good stuff. Because remember, there was a time when we didn't know any of that stuff either. And in many cases, we learned the hard way because we wrote our code, we scattered a bunch of, you know, a bunch of statements to check whether or not we were online or offline or what have you. And we didn't actually think that if we pull this into one place, if we need to change that code, we can replace it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the realm of the inadvertent yet reckless debt. Reckless because we did it. We did it, you know, somewhat deliberately. We just didn't realize that what we were doing was going to create a problem down the road. The deliberate prudent debt is the MacBook story. We walk up to this project and we say, you know what? It's pretty clear that um, we're on tight deadlines. In some cases, we may be on deadlines that are not under our control. For example, a number of years ago, Rocket Mortgage was preparing to release their new website. 
that would allow you to get a mortgage online, and they were going to talk about it as a television commercial during the Super Bowl. You do not get to push the Super Bowl back by a couple of days if your project is not ready to go. You just don't. Same sort of thing, right? If all of a sudden the Polish soccer team is doing amazingly well during the World Cup and you work for a sports company and they want to start you know, pr producing some online e-commerce deals on Polish jerseys and whistles and I don't know, white and red face paint or whatever, you can't, you can't push back the World Cup. You are stuck to a deadline. You must have this ready by the time, the next time the polls take the field. And so you deliberately say, yep, we know this is gonna be a mess. We are just gonna hack shit together until we get this to work and we'll deal with the fallout later. That is deliberate and prudent debt because prudent, if you can get in on this, as a sports company, somebody that sells soccer balls and jerseys and so forth, if you can get in on this, you can catch that wave of fanaticism. That's, the, that's where we get the word fan, by the way, is fanatics. You can capture all of that and probably make a ton of money by doing so. Inadvertent prudent debt is the one that we're all very, very familiar with, which is, after we've built it once, now we know how we should have done it the first time. Right? Everybody has been on a project where after the project was done, or at least phase one was done, you could go back and now having a sense of what it is we were supposed to build, you can look at it and say, oh yeah, that's where the variability in that design should have been. That's where we should have put you know, the, the, the inheritance or that's where we should have put the composition. That's where we should have put the ability to configure rather than have it baked in code. In retrospect, right? There's the old American saying, hindsight is always 2020. It's really easy to look in the past and say, that's the way we should have done it. That is the inadvertent. We didn't intend to make mistakes. But, you know, we did, we did what we needed to do in order to get it out of the way, prudent. And now if we're really prudent, we will go back and start paying down that inadvertently acquired technical debt. By the way, just to be really, really clear, no project in the history of computer science has ever shipped without some technical debt, ever. There is a book, if you're curious to sort of see how the fantasy scenario where you have unlimited budget and unlimited time, no deadline, there's a book called Dreaming in Code that talks about the open source Chandler project. How many people have heard of that project? One hand back there, and he's probably thinking of the wrong thing. The Chandler Project was an attempt to create the world's best personal information manager. In other words, email, calendaring, contacts, all of that stuff that we generally, you know, we, we, we let Outlook deal with that, or we have various apps on our phones, and they kind of sort of work together, not very well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Chandler Project was going to solve all of that. It was gonna be an open source project, it was funded by somebody who had gotten rich in the Silicon Valley, and he said, I do not want to ship it until it's ready. You developers tell me when it's ready, and then we will ship it. And the book, Dreaming in Code, follows the author basically, it's a journalist author, but he joins the project. He's a part of the meetings. He's there when, for example, the, the team lead decides he needs a break and takes off on a six-month sabbatical, and a new team lead joins the team in order to lead them now to you know, keep Chandler moving forward. And ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you that this book is a Stephen King novel for software developers. It is a non-stop horror show. You find yourself reading the book and the team lead goes off on vacation and you go, oh no. 
oh, and they're hiring a new team lead. Oh, this is bad. Oh, and he wants to call a meeting. Oh, shit. And he wants to discuss the object relational mapping layer they're using for persistence. You're like, don't go, don't go to the meeting, don't go. Don't open the door, the killer's hiding behind it. And sure enough, he wants to switch everything over from a relational basis to an object database or something. So they gotta rip out tons of code, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, Chandler never shipped. No, I take it back. It shipped a V1 and then died. It never shipped anything after that. Dreaming in Code, great book. Every project incurs technical debt, period. The useful distinction isn't between debt or non-debt, but between prudent and reckless debt. When you are faced with a decision, this is the time when you start asking yourself, what are the various criteria by which you're making this decision? Are we taking on debt with this decision? And if the answer is yes, that again, is not necessarily a bad thing. Because if we're taking on this debt in order to be able to get past an obstacle, that's a good thing. But is this in fact a prudent use of our time? Is this in fact a prudent use of our limited resources, et cetera, et cetera? Could we buy something to perhaps get us out of this? Do we have to build it? Or could we build something as opposed to having to spend some of our limited budget? There's no right or wrong answers here. The key is to sort of engage in this philosophical one level abstraction up to say, why are we making this decision and what are we going to do after we've made this decision? For example, do we actually have a plan to pay it off? Or are we just gonna trust management when they say, yeah, 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 no, 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 we'll fix it all in the point one release, or in phase two, or in the next phase, or my personal favorite, oh yeah, the, the, the administrators will fix that all. Back in the day before the cloud, you know, you used to give your fixed application, your working applications to the system administrators who would operate the server room, and the manager looked me square in the eye and said, no, 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 it's okay. The admins will fix it. Boss, they don't know anything about Java. They'll learn. <laughs> when are they gonna learn? Oh, they just sit in the server room all day. They don't do anything. <laughs> oh boy. Obviously, the concern here is leaving the debt in place for too long. If we just let it linger, if we just let it continue to accumulate, it's going to create problems. Because the thing is, the code just doesn't stay still. If we could just say, hey, we've shipped it and nobody will ever touch it again, and the code works and nothing will ever change around it, yeah, you're right, the, the, the technical debt, who cares? The fact is, most of the world today cashes its paycheck with COBOL at some point or another, and you wanna talk about legacy technical debt, <laughs> it doesn't get much bigger than COBOL, but it works. So part of the question here is, do we have a plan? How much will it cost us to replace? And in some cases, as many of these high-level vice presidents and CTOs at these large financial companies, they're doing the numbers. Trust me, every year, somebody comes to them and says, we should totally replace all that COBOL code. And they say, yeah, put together a plan. Talk about migrating all the databases, talk about migrating all the logic, talk about testing it side by side to make sure it's all gonna work the same way because God help us if we have a bug, right? I don't know about you, but when they add two plus two, I really don't want it to come up with three in my bank account. Five would be okay, <laughs> right? We obviously want to pay off this debt. Do we have a plan? Do we know how we would even begin to approach it? Because code will constantly migrate. There will be a weird thing and somebody will go in and fix that one weird thing. There will be another weird thing and they'll go in and fix in that other weird thing until the code doesn't even look like when we released it to production because we've been doing all these spot fixes along the way. That's when the interest is really starting to pile up 
And the code it starts turning into a massive mess because now we've got this global variable to indicate whether or not we're in this part of the code that's a workaround for this bug over here that we can't actually fix. So you gotta flip that variable on, do this little workaround, and then flip that variable back off. But now there's another patch of code that says if that variable's on, we need to actually turn it off slightly because we're in a slightly different branch, oh God. Throw away code. There's gonna be cases where we're gonna write something to be intended to be thrown away and people will wanna keep it around and I'm not trying to tell you that this is a good plan. I am not trying to suggest that this scenario is the best use of our technical debt. You probably wanna think about it more in terms of a budget. One of my colleagues a number of years ago coined this idea of a technical complexity budget. Within any given project, you only have a certain amount of complexity that you can have on the project before it all starts to feel like technical debt. Making those deliberate, prudent decisions to whether we want to take a shortcut here, whether we want to introduce something more complex, whether we want to do something really simple. And by the way, I can easily imagine scenarios where the complex thing is where the debt is, as opposed to the simple thing, which is the right thing to do, or the simple thing feels like that's where we're incurring the debt and the complex thing would make it go away. Be careful what sort of quality attributes you associate to some of these adverbs and adjectives. When I say good code, what does it look like? This is one of the challenges I frequently put in front of programmers, particularly when we're talking about job descriptions. Senior developer must write good code. Great, what does that look like? And it's very amusing how quickly two people who've worked together for years will disagree violently on what good code should look like. Does it make use of all of the latest and greatest language features that allows us to be able to do like multiple things in one statement? Or is it actually the opposite of that? Code that is explicitly explicit about what it's doing, each and every step very carefully lined out on its own line with, with no amount of shorthand whatsoever. It's fascinating how what do you think good code looks like can lead a very, very interesting discussion amongst your development team. Quick sidebar, there are times when actually the quick and dirty approach would be the best approach to take. Here's what I mean by this. A number of years ago, DZone, the uh, developer portal, threw out an article that said, is this the age of throwaway software systems? Out of curiosity, how many people here are working on a software project that has been around for longer than five years. And I mean in production longer than five years. Okay, keep your hands up. Has it been there for longer than 10? Longer than 20? 25? Pretty much, there's like a couple of like COBOL programmers back there in the back. <laughs> yeah, and the one guy's like, yeah, shit, he found us. Damn it, we thought we could hide here. Java is the new COBOL and all that. And keep in mind, I was maybe about half the room, maybe a third of the room. The rest of us are on projects that haven't been around for five years. Now, aside from the COBOL code that we talked about, how many of you are aware of software programs at your company or your clients that have been running for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? They're just not there. Now, some of that you can say, well, it's because we wrote a bunch of crap code and so we had to replace it after a while. Yeah, and I also was around writing C++ code in the day when Java first came around, and I remember being on projects that were written in Java designed to replace the C++ code because the company wanted to be working with the latest and greatest. There was no real added features intended for this. There was no real 
purpose other than the company didn't want to have legacy C++ code sitting around. And this was 1999, 2000 timeframe. These people are engaged in preemptive replacement of these C++ systems, which by the way, were supposedly engineered to last for 50 years. <laughs> and we're already trying to replace them because C++ is not the latest and greatest. I saw the same thing repeat with C Sharp. I saw the same thing repeat with Ruby. I've seen the same thing happen with JavaScript. How many times are we going to write the same project in whatever the latest and greatest technology is and call it progress? Do we live in an era of throwaway systems? It's a really, really interesting question. Because coupled with this is the very real question of where are our customers? Do we have customers? Are we trying to break into a new market? Because under all these scenarios, time to market becomes a really, really important consideration. Everybody loves to be the first mover into a market. We cleverly ignore the fact that Google, who ended up taking over internet search, was not even close to the first to market with internet search, with any sort of categorization or ontology of the internet. But yeah, okay, whatever. And you know, Apple wasn't the first one to create a mobile phone, and they weren't the first one to create a music player. But you walk into any startup environment, and these people will be talking about time to market, time to market, time to market. How long can you get your thing out in front of customers so that customers can start using it so that they can start, in some cases, all the startup founder wants is something that's out there so that they can go back out and start doing another round of funding. This time to market thing is actually really kind of important if you're in that space. <coughs> Excuse me. Systems are no longer targeted to be long lived. That's kind of frightening if you think about it. But I'll give you an example. How many of you have a Nest thermostat? Nest was a company in the States, made these lovely electronic thermostats. You could connect to them, you could get your phone to plug into the network, and you could like set the temperature in your house from anywhere in the world. Number of companies followed suit very, very quickly because this was, you know, the smart home was going to become big, it's gonna be huge. It's gonna represent a billion, trillion, quadrillion, I forget what numbers they were throwing around. And then Nest got acquired by Google and a lot of the Nest functionality doesn't exist anymore. Technically Nest, the company themselves don't exist anymore, I think. Certainly a bunch of their knockoffs got picked up by some of the bigger companies, AT&T was one such, and I was just talking with a friend, actually my wife was talking with one of her friends, I just heard the story third hand through her, but they've, they, they've moved into a new house and some alarm keeps going off. And so they contacted the company that owns the alarm system at this house. Now bear in mind, they just moved in and the previous owners did as previous owners will, they canceled the contract with the company that maintains this system because they weren't gonna live there anymore. So new homeowners come in, this alarm's going off, they contact the company, the company says, oh yeah, no, that, that system's deprecated. You know, you're not the contract, first of all, you're not the contract holder, so we can't really do anything with you. Well, what if we buy a contract thinking, well, pay the minimum three months or whatever and then cancel it. Oh, we don't sell that contract anymore because that system is deprecated. We're getting out of that business. So now these homeowners have hardware in their house that they really don't know how to remove that was put there by a company as part of a contract that they were never a part of that's currently malfunctioning and they have no way to get any support for it. Because this all made sense, somewhere. The whole notion of agile also, to some degree, contributes to this. 
Because in many cases, in the interests of agility, we actually work to try to implement incomplete specifications. Don't get me wrong, I'm not bashing on Agile per se, but Agile does have, it incurs its own set of consequences when you utilize it, when somebody comes to you and says, hey, we wanna be Agile, we're gonna set a customer down right next to you while you're working on the software, the on-site customer, we're gonna do short sprints, we're gonna focus on getting value out the door as quickly as possible, yeah, you are, by definition, working off of an incomplete specification because the eight questions that come up, in some cases, they may even stump the customer sitting next to you. This happened to me once doing some work at Pacific Bell. We were having to do a certain amount of business logic. What do we do in this particular scenario with this particular class of service and this particular set of conditions arises? And the person that was working with us was like, I don't know. I literally don't know what we should do there. What does the existing code do? So we actually did, this was actually some old COBOL code, it's the closest I've ever come to it, and one of the COBOL coders looked at the code and says, oh, that's what we do, we crash. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, we just end the program, and so when that happens, it goes into a dead letter queue, and then a human basically picks it up and goes from there. Well, where are those humans? I don't know, it looks like we let the last one go four years ago. So what should we do? I don't know, talk to him. Well, I don't know, let me talk to my boss. I don't know, let me talk to... This is one of the dangers, in some cases, of following an Agile-based approach. We do the best we can. We give it our best guess. And I don't mean we, just the developers. I mean we, the whole team, which includes that on-site customer. And... Quite frankly, remember, part of the reason we do these iterations in Agile is so that if we ever start to deviate away from what the customer finds valuable, we can correct. We don't talk about it much, but part of the reason we do these two-week sprints, these two-week iterations, is so that when the customer says, oh, yeah, no, that's not how that's supposed to work at all, we can throw it away. You don't have to keep the results of a sprint if the customer says we, that's not actually what we want. You are perfectly capable of throwing that code away rather than trying to keep it and now fix it. I mean, why would you deliberately keep code that you know is wrong? So we can prove to our boss that we earned our paycheck. Okay, sure, you can say, look, all the lines of code we wrote, boss. And if you're metricized by lines of code, in other words, your value to the company is based on the number of lines of code you produced, you have a bigger problem. If the result is too far away from what it's supposed to be, throw it away. Redo the sprint. Don't get me wrong, that really should be a res, you know, last order kind of result, but sometimes that's the right thing to do. Inc., the business site, the importance of quick and dirty. When we work on something, we pay careful attention to the details and take the time to polish every little thing until it's just right. As a result, 37 Signals, you guys know that name, right? Known for a focus on quality and we take that reputation very seriously, it turns out that that's a problem. Recently began exploring an idea for a new product. We sketched out a bunch of ideas. All of us were excited and working hard, but a week later, we had almost nothing to show for the effort. Nearly two months had passed, and we still had no idea if it would work. What happened was we forgot we were just building a quick and dirty demo for ourselves. You're just out there to prove the point. Could this even work? Is this a reasonable idea? If I show this to a couple of people, friends, family, etc., will they go, ooh, or will they go, huh? In some cases, that's all you're looking for is that kind of validation to know whether or not we should actually make a sizable investment into this product. Can't do that until you have something to show. Obsessing about quality too early in the creative process prevents a lot of good ideas from taking shape. The wrong sets of pressures are brought to bear, doubts, deadlines, resource planning, all of this stuff is essential, but only later on. 
Startups make this mistake on a regular basis. They start thinking about what their end product will be and forget that you gotta get your first customer, then you get your 10th customer, then you get your 100th customer, then you get your 1,000th and your 10,000th and your 100,000th, and by that point, you probably need to start worrying about scale. Not at one or 10 or 100, but you're never gonna get any of these customers until you put something in their hands. Minimum viable product. How many people heard that term before, MVP? Yeah. This is the whole point of a minimum viable product. Smallest set of features possible that actually work. That's what we're really talking about here. Frequently, when you are looking to vet a new idea, the right thing to do is to get some version of it in the hands of people so that they can start playing with it. Get to that first customer. By the way, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is the minimum viable product doesn't even have to be software. If you can write something out on a piece of paper and a customer can interact with it and you can still carry out and sell your service or sell your product, that is a perfectly viable minimum viable product. And then when that person buys that thing, they say, yeah, no, this is actually really good. I, I like this. Okay, cool. Now we start thinking about how to do this at a certain amount of additional reach by putting it on the internet or additional scale by having it be able to support multiple people simultaneously, whatever. All you're trying to do is validate the idea at this point. This is where the concept of the prototype is actually supposed to kick in. When you have an idea, gosh, I think it would be a really, really good idea to offer a mortgage service on pet homes. Like if somebody wants to build a really nice dog house for Bowser, they can take a loan. You're not laughing. I really thought that was a joke. <laughs> but maybe there's a market here, hang on. I know there is in the Silicon Valley. People have been doing some really bizarre things with, with pet homes in the Silicon Valley. But now I need to prove or disprove this hypothesis. How do I do that? How do I validate that there is a market for people who are willing to take out a loan in order to build a really nice glam house for their pit bull? Well, obviously it's gonna take some amount of money but I also need to work out the terms, financing, et cetera. I can do all of this without any software. Or perhaps your idea is you wanna build a game, or perhaps your idea is you wanna build, I don't know, you wanna do an Airbnb for pets, or you wanna do DoorDash for pets. And by the way, those have actually been done, just so you know. The point is the prototype helps you validate or invalidate your hypothesis. This doesn't happen all the time, by the way, exclusively in business. This can also be true in technology. You can say to yourself, I wonder if Flutter is any good. My hypothesis is that Flutter can, in fact, be everything that we need our mobile app to be. So now you sit down and you don't completely rebuild your company's mobile application. You find a couple of things that may be tricky that you wrote in the native Swift or the native Android code and you rewrite those in Flutter to see if Flutter would in fact be able to do what it is you're looking to do. And then hypothesis proved or disproved, you can go to the boss and talk about whether or not we should in fact embrace Flutter. This is kind of the whole point of a prototype or at least in its hypothetical scenario. All of this really gets us to this point of iterations. The whole point of Agile is to give us feedback. Why do you write unit tests? Because the boss makes me. Okay, but why does the boss make you? Never mind, that's, because that's, that's what the guy at the conference told him to do. Okay, fine. But seriously, why do the Agile folk want you to write unit tests? because the next time you write code 
and it breaks something entirely in a different place than the code where you're working, the unit test suite will catch it as soon as it's run. It's feedback about the system before it gets in the hands of the users. And assuming that you have implemented a standard CI CD pipeline, then you will get that feedback as soon as you commit the code. Now, ideally, you would run all of the unit tests on the software as right there on your local laptop. But when you get to systems of any significant size, that could take a non-trivial amount of time to run the comprehensive unit test suite for all the different modules and features and so forth in the system. So we'll settle for, does it break anything close to where I'm working? And then we'll let the CI CD pipeline tell us if it breaks anything anywhere else. And when it does, we get that immediate feedback that says, oh, something broke. We can see the pull request that did it. And now we can go investigate why code here broke something over there. Feedback. Because otherwise, without the unit tests, it would not be until some QA tester played around with the code and went, that's weird. That's broken over here. And they would probably need to spend days hunting this one down. Or worse yet, customer discovers it. Feedback. Everything in Agile is about feedback. Why do we release every two weeks so the customer can see it and give us feedback? Why do we do stories? Because that way the developers get what's in the users or in the, the analyst or the champions, the product owner is the term now. We get in there, we get into their head quicker. We get feedback as to what that feature looks like more quickly. Everything in Agile is built around the idea of giving you more rapid feedback. Working software is the primary measure of progress. Simplicity, the amount, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. We're responding to change instead of following a plan. All of this is coming out of the Agile Manifesto. An iterative process is one that makes progress through successive refinement. We take a first cut, perhaps something quick and dirty, knowing it is incomplete or weak, then we iteratively refine until the product is satisfactory. Partly because if we need to stop somewhere, the customer at least has something, even if it doesn't do everything that they want it to do. By the way, just so you know, Agile isn't the only one that talks heavily about this idea of iterations. Anybody here ever heard of OODA, O-O-D-A? Would be surprised if you had, because it's not really out of our domain. The OODA loop was uh, discovered, invented, something, by a gentleman by the name of John Boyd. And Boyd is actually known as 62nd Boyd because he was an aircraft pilot, specifically a fighter pilot. He was known as 62nd Boyd because if you went up and got into a dogfight with him, the story was that he could get on your six, in other words, right behind you, preparing to shoot you down within 60 seconds or less. Now, I don't know if, you know, this was back in the 50s, 40s and 50s when he was doing this, but he carries a certain amount of respect within the aerial combat space. And Boyd later started doing a more detailed philosophical and analytical analysis of air combat. From that is where we get a lot of the various principles of aircraft combat physics that guide a lot of the fighter, pilot or fighter plane design that we see in use today. And he said that a pilot goes through this four-step cycle. Both pilots go through this four-step cycle on a regular basis, observe, you gather data around you. Where am I? Where is my enemy? How, you know, how fast are we going? What altitude do we have, etc.? We gather some data, we observe. We orient. What if this data is useful and what are my options currently? Well, if he's behind me, I need to get him off of my six. If I'm behind him or if he's over there and I need to, you figure out exactly what your available options are before you decide on a course of action and then carry it out. Observe, orient, decide, act. 
The fundamental, unavoidable, and all-pervasive presence of uncertainty is the starting point. Where is he? I don't know where the bad guy is. So that's like the very essence of uncertainty. Somebody up here in the sky wants to shoot me down. Where are they? I don't know. I, I, I don't have any data. We must be able to form mental concepts of observed reality and change those concepts as reality itself appears to change. It's very common that pilots will try to approach you with the sun at their back so that when you look at them, you're actually staring into the sun. There were several phrases for this for many years, uh, amongst, for example, the uh, aerial pilots of the RAF during World War II, right? The Germans would come in with the sun behind them. It was known the Hun from the sun was the phrase they used. And now once I've started to establish that, okay, they must be over there in the sun somewhere, and as soon as I catch a glimpse of metal over here in the cloud, I need to reorient. I need to completely change my set of assumptions. This is just like Agile. We think we know what's going to happen as part of this project. We've got funding for the next nine months. And then the boss walks in the door and says, okay, guys, just so you know, turns out the funding that we thought we were gonna get fell through. And we've gotta ship what we've got right now. And you have to adjust, you have to reorient. Or we got more funding, or we're being acquired, or we're going to hire more people, or whatever changes up the mental reality. You've got to adjust to it. And many people have looked at the loops in Boyd's OODA loop and looked at the loops that are in Agile, the iterations, and said, aha, Agile and OODA, they're the same thing, except... Boyd's stated aim was to get inside the opponent's OODA loop. If I can do, if I can go through this loop entirely in say five seconds and it takes you 10, I will shoot you down every single time. If as a company, it takes your company six months to go from concept to some kind of reality, MVP or otherwise, and it takes me three months, I will win by whatever definition you care to name. Because as soon as you come out with a new feature, I can replicate it within three months. If I come out with a new feature, well, you've got to take six months, and in that time, I can actually come up with three new features. If I can get inside your OODA loop, I win. It's not the loop itself, but how quickly you can move through it as opposed to whatever other opponents you face. Can I get inside your loop? Can I see what you're doing and adjust based on what I see you doing? We want feedback. That's why Agile has become so popular. That's why Agile has become so necessary for companies to be able to execute quickly. And you can't get feedback until something is up and running. I see startups overthinking simple problems, adding too much structure too early, trying to get formal too soon. Startups should embrace their scrappiness, not rush to toss it aside. The ability to run with scissors is a blessing, not a curse. If you are at a company that has an architectural committee and every new design has to be passed through them before you can in fact begin coding anything and you have to then present a database schema to the database engineers before you can even get a sample database up in the system, you're not agile. You're not gonna get that feedback. It's gonna take you months, if not years, before you will determine whether or not this idea that some marketing guy had for mortgage for pet domiciles is any good, and a competitor will probably swoop in and seize that opportunity before you ever get the chance to decide whether it's something we want to pursue. If you actually get to the point 
where you have delivered something that's great, stop. We lose sight of this sometimes. We keep wanting to do more because it's like we've been successful, let's keep going. But if it's in fact what the customer wanted, stop. It's okay. You may find your boss has different ideas and yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you may have to do what the boss tells you, but if you are in control of this in some, wa- in some way, even though you can see very clearly the additional features that could be made for this, even though you can see clearly all the additional things you should do, unless the customer tells you they want more, stop. Quick and dirty, we started by saying terrible, bad, awful. As a matter of fact, if you go look at some of the various opinions written by some you know, fairly old graybeards who will stand up and talk about software craftsmanship, you are a craftsman. You should be proud of everything you do, like you've chiseled your initials in gold filigree upon the butt of this pistol that you have handcrafted from the finest materials. Frankly, To me, much of the craftsmanship movement is more about ego than actual actual advice. It's much more about me feeling good about what it is I've built than in the stated aim of actually bringing something useful to customers so that I can get that feedback so that we can decide whether or not we want to continue with this. If we care about our craft, we obviously want to get better at what we do But there are times, and we've talked about a bunch of them, when the right thing to do is to do something that's quick and dirty. How do you know when? Well, some questions to think about. Does this problem go away once we finish writing this bit of software? If I hack together a Ruby script that's gonna empty data from this database over here and populate it into this database over here, is this database going to be refilled? Is there going to be new data that's coming in? Because if so, this problem is not just a one and done. We are in fact gonna have this problem later and that Ruby script will live far longer than we intended it to. Does it have more angles to it? Is there more than one database we may need to pull from? Are we considering keeping this around for more than five years? This is really, really common in acquisition scenarios where we're trying to consolidate multiple systems. And I use the term acquisition here very loosely, whether it's we acquired an extra company or we acquired a new department. I am not here to tell you that this is the only way you should build things. Look, if you're trying to build something that you already know is going to need to be around for five, 10, 15 years, yeah, minimum viable product, but you're deliberately taking a little bit of debt. I'm not trying to tell you to throw away all the architecture and all the other patterns and all the other practices that we have come to embrace as part of building solid software. But when the boss comes to you and says, the marketing department needs to know whether we could do X, This is not the time to pull out your Fowler and try to figure out which of the distributed enterprise patterns you should be using. Slam something together to get it to the point where it can work and then, oops, the repository got deleted. Sorry, boss, it works, but we can't do anything with it. The source code is all gone. Oh, okay, don't lie to your boss. But maybe lie to your boss. What is the purpose of this project? How long will it live? What are the other angles associated with this? This will help you determine whether or not you can or and should do something nicely drawn out or quick and dirty. And remember, quick and dirty isn't a bad word. Enjoy the rest of the conference.